In today's video, we are looking at the drug classification sulfonamides, or better known as sulfa drugs. And we're going to be looking at what clues can we get out of this word to help us quickly recall pieces of information related to administering this medication, whether it's for a test, patient education, or just your general awareness, right after this. All right, so let's look at what folic acid does for us. First of all, our bodies do not synthesize it. We don't make it naturally, so we need to consume it through our diet, those leafy vegetables kind of thing. And folic acid is needed to help our cells grow and multiply. So already I'm thinking grow and multiply, that's a function of DNA. Folic acid is needed to synthesize pyrenes and pyridamines, which is a precursor to the production of DNA and RNA. Now, as I said, our healthy cells cannot produce it on their own, so they rely on folic acid entering into the cell in order for, those, for this chain reaction to occur. So folic acid is going to come over here and enter a healthy cell. Now, bacteria are impermeable to folic acid. Folic acid cannot just enter into the bacteria. They actually have to create their own folic acid. And so para amino benzoic acid binds here to the bacteria and this is all going to be important in a second and that allows the bacteria then to synthesize its own folic acid to continue on with cell growth and replication now when we have bacteria what we're looking for is to prevent the bacteria from continuing to grow and we know that this para amino benzoic acid is what is allowing the bacteria to create and synthesize its own folic acid. So we want to stop that because we know folic acid will lead to the synthesis of pyrenes and to, to the synthesis of DNA. So if we can stop that whole process, the cell will die. So what a sulfa drug does, let's just put here my sulfa. It's very competitive. Sulfa drug is going to bind here and take that seat at the table so that the para-aminobenzoic acid cannot. So this is going to halt the process of the bacteria creating its own folic acid. So the sulfa drug will be competitive for the receptor site and then it will block the para-aminobenzoic acid from attaching, which means the bacteria can no longer grow, it can no longer multiply, and it dies. So that is how a sulfa drug works on the bacterial cell. Well, here's some of the clues I want to share with you. So we have folic acid, F-O, Folic acid is what it is working on to prevent DNA production. Here we have the NA, I'm just going to put the D here, and we have our DNA, folic acid. Its site of action is actually at the para-aminobenzoic acid. So here we have ami for amino. So that's my, these are my clues inside the word sulfonamides that okay. All right, so when it comes back to naming the generic drugs, remember generic is the low, uh, lowercase letter, a brand name starts with a capital letter. So we have sulfa salazine, sulfa diazine, and cotrimoxazole. Cotrimoxazole is a combination of two drugs, one being a sulfa drug, so sulfa methoxazole and trimethylprim. So if you ever have a test question asking you which two drugs make up cotrimoxazole, here's your try to remember trimethylprim and moxazole is the ending of your sulfa drug. So there we go, okay? So sulfonamides or sulfa drugs are used to treat gram-negative and gram-positive bacterial infections, okay? Now, in terms of clues, when you look at the word as to which drugs match which diagnoses, you can use the first two letters to help you remember STIs and UTIs, and then you're gonna have to memorize the next two, pneumonia and trachoma. Trachoma is actually a leading cause of blindness, so this is an interesting one and then pneumonia, the H influenza, the E. coli, those kind of things. Okay, so now we know the classification, the types of drugs we might expect to see. We know where it works, its site of action, and how it's inhibiting folic acid from being produced inside bacterial cells, so it actually stops cell growth and cell replication in unhealth, unhealthy bacterial infested cells. We also know that it's preventing DNA and it's blocking para-aminobenzoic acid, and that they're all going to start with sulfa. So the next thing that we need to look at is how do they work? How do they move through the body? So they're pretty standard. They will be absorbed through the GI tract, metabolized by the liver, and excreted. So these are going to be metabolized by the liver, 
no, absorbed, sorry, they'll be absorbed by the GI tract, metabolized by the liver, and then excreted through the GU system, which is your kidneys. And so with sulfonamides, we do want to be doing a kidney baseline because some of the side effects are related to the glomerulus's ability to filter through the blood. Now let's talk about the side effects. Now because it's an antibiotic, we know it's going to affect both the good and the bad, so like the healthy cells and the bacterial infested cells. So we are going to lose some of our natural flora, which always means we need to be watching out for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, any abdominal discomfort, and maybe even a loss of appetite, okay? So those are pretty common side effects with antibiotics. Other things you want to watch for are signs and symptoms of kidney injury. We may notice hematuria, so that's blood in the urine, proteinuria, so there's protein in the urine, which you can't see. It needs to be measured in a lab test. And of course, this can escalate to maybe a more serious injury, such, so we may have um, nephrotic syndrome or even possibly a toxic nephrosis. Now, in our elderly population, sometimes the effects on the CNS system, so the dizziness, the vertigo, might be a little bit more pronounced when they're on these medications. Now, one of the other side effects, side effects you'd want to watch out for and, and let your patient know about is photosensitivity. So, SU again, I really draw on the letters and the words to help me pop out some of these things, but the sun photosensitive and Stevens-Johnson syndrome. That's uh, kind of like where the skin starts to peel off. It's a significant reaction to the drugs. Make sure you're letting your patients know about these things because we don't want them in the sun if they're on these drugs. So this all leads into our patient education, right? So they're oral drugs and they should be taken before a meal or after a meal, so one hour before or two hours after. That will help get the body um, primed so that it can best absorb these drugs so they have the best effect at the sites intended. If there's a bit of GI upset, then small frequent meals would be okay, but ideally before or after a meal. Take with lots of water. Okay, so we're back with a clean slate. I'd like to encourage you to do this as well. And drop in the comments below if this is helping you to remember some of the key things when it comes to these drug classifications and identifying them on a test or in practice. Um, write down the word sulfonamide and just see which pieces of this word pop out to you now and help you remember what they're for, how they're used, um, side effects, how they're administered, all those pieces that come to drug administration. And I'm going to do a review here as well. So feel free to pause this and come back when you're done. So the first thing we know is that sulfa drugs, we would recognize sulfadiazine as a sulfonamide. Awesome. Now, where does it work? Why do we take it? It's gram positive, gram negative. You just have to memorize that one. But I remember that in bacterial cells, it's actually very competitive with the site for the para-aminobenzoic acid. That's my clue here. And that is needed in order for the bacteria to synthesize folic acid. That's my clue here. So that it will prevent DNA from being synthesized. So the cell will die as a result. This word has a really significant clue as to the whole chain process. So I know it's given for gram negative, gram positive. I remember looking at the S and the U that it's for STI, UTI, and you remember the other two? Pneumonia and trachoma. Awesome. So perfect. So now we know why it's used, why my patient might get it. We know how it's going to work for my patient, how it's going to kill off the bacteria. I do remember that it's given orally. This is one of those drugs that's only given orally, so the O for oral, and that they should take it an hour before and two hours after. Some of the side effects we want to teach about is we want to avoid the sun because it can create photosensitivity and Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So we're going to like double down on this S here. This S gets a lot of work in this word and teach our patient and how to watch for Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is kind of like a real, it's like a, a burn. It's like the skin just peels off. Um, I remember looking at that letter D, and so if my patients are on anti-diabetic drugs, I need to be able to tell them to watch their blood sugars because they may have more frequent hypoglycemic events, and so they should be watching their sugars more often. So we have a lot of information that this word gives us, and then just a few pieces to memorize as we go forward working with it. Now, if you have worked with this word in a different way, drop it in the comments below. Let us know how you work with this word in order to pull out pieces of information quickly so that you don't have to go back to your drug guide for every piece of information, especially when you're having to work with a patient. It's high acuity, lots of things to do, but also when you're writing your tests. Drop in your hints below in the comments. 
All right, so it's time for our NCLEX review, and you're gonna wanna recall the reasons why this drug is taken. There's my big hint for you. But go ahead and pause this if you'd like. I'll read the question. The nurse is caring for a patient on co-trimoxazole. That's the sulfa and trimethoprim combo. What assessment finding would indicate that the drug is working as expected? A, the patient's diarrhea has stopped. B, the ear infection has cleared up. C, the patient's blood pressure is normal. Or D, the urine is clear and the patient reports no pain with urination. All right, guys, so if you answer D, you are correct. And that has to go back to why it's used. UTIs, STIs, pneumonia, and trachoma. And so we're not treating diarrhea, ear infections, or blood pressure. Well done, guys. Thanks for watching, guys. This has been a really quick way to learn your drugs and make it a little bit more fun so that you don't have to work so hard memorizing and cramming, but you can actually take what's in the word to help you out. Until next time, make it a great day. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell so you get notifi notified when the next video is released.